looks like we have a lot of people out this morning. Where's everybody at? <laughs> I hope so too, right? Well, listen, we're, uh, we're going to pick back up where we were the week before last in 1 Kings, in 1 Kings chapter 18. Uh, last time we were talking about, we actually focused primarily uh, on just one verse, and that verse was uh, verse 21, and uh, it's where Elijah confronted the people of Israel after he had talked to Ahab. Ahab called all the people together and uh, of Israel and, and brought forth his prophets and and uh, um, and Elijah spoke to the to the crowd to the people of Israel, and he says in verse twenty one, he says, and Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow Him; but if Baal, follow Him. But the people answered him not a word. And we talked about teeter totting right on that middle ground, thinking that we're secure and safe there, but there really is no middle ground. Elijah was confronting Israel because Israel had been drawn away from the Lord, the worship of the true God, into Baal worship. And now Elijah was confronting them saying, how long will you falter between two opinions? Right? Either if the Lord is God, let him be Lord. If not, then let him be Baal. But choose, right? Choose this day. And so, Paul, we talked about what it meant to choose the Lord and, and that we can't set on this middle ground, right? Well, today we're going to pick up in verse 22. What I want to do, I'm going to read a lot of scripture this morning. In fact, we're going to be turning a lot in our Bibles this morning, if you have your Bible this morning. All right, if not, we do have the Scriptures up here on the screen. But we're going to be looking at some different passages of Scripture um, and talking, though, about one particular item or one particular thing, um, and that is the altar. And, but what I want to do, first of all, is I want to pick up here in verse 22. I'm going to read all the way through to verse 39. Uh, we're going to stop and pray, and then we're going to get into the message this morning, okay? So let's begin reading. Starting with verse 22, it says, Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left, the prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore let them give us two bulls, and let them choose one bull for themselves. <laughs> Cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. So all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many. And call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given them and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning even till noon, saying, O oh, Bell, hear us. But there was no voice. No one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made, and so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is meditating, or he is busy, or he is on a journey. Or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they cried, out, uh, cried aloud and cut themselves, as was their custom, with knives and lances, until the blood gushed out on them. And when midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near me. So all the people came near to him, and he, re and he prepared the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. And then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two seahs of seed. And he put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, and laid it on the wood, and said, Fill your water pots with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifices and, and on the wood. Then he said, Do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. <clears throat> and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the, and the wood 
and the stones and the dust, and it licked it up, and licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. If you would, let's bow our heads. Father, we just want to thank you again, God, for the opportunity to gather here this morning, God, to sit underneath your word. Father, I pray, God, that you would open up our hearts, our minds, our understanding, God, to it, Lord. What you desire for us is what we want, Lord. So I pray, God, that you would speak and minister to our hearts, God, through your spirit. Father, I pray, God, that you would set me aside, Lord, and use me as a vessel, God, for you to work in and through, Lord. I'm nothing more but an instrument for you to use, Father. So, God, we just praise you. We thank you, God, for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, the subject that I want to talk to you today about is the altar. The first thing that Elijah did, it says, after, the, after he mocked the prophets, I thought that was pretty good, right? Amen. And on their false God. He's like, Where, your, where's your God at, right? Is he awake? Is he asleep? See, everything that he was saying against Baal, he knew his God stood true to because he knows that the God of Israel never, neither sleeps nor does he slumber, right? But he's always attentive, he's always awake, and he's always watching. <laughs> but then, the first thing that he did after mocking them is it says that he repaired the altar of the Lord. You see, whenever in Israel, whenever Israel would turn away from God, Right, whenever they, if you were to look in 1 Kings and 2 Kings and you start looking at all the kings of Israel and you see that there were some who were good kings who did right in the sight of the Lord and then you see that there were some that were evil, did wicked in the sight of the Lord. Those who did wicked in the sight of the Lord were those who turned the hearts of the people away from God. And they did it through idol worship. They, they did it by allowing false, uh, false gods to come in and to be taught, and to be prophesied about, and, and it would turn the hearts of the people away from God. And this is exactly what has happened here with, with King Ahab and Jezebel and Israel during this time. Their hearts have been turned away from God, and turned to worship the false god Baal. And what, what Elijah does is he says, he says that he repairs the altar of the Lord. Can I tell you that if you were to look in the scripture, and, and, and look in the Old Testament, you see that that every time that Israel was turned away from God, but there'd be a, a good king who came on site, he would drive out the idol worship, tear down the false, I mean the, the, the altars to the false gods, and he would repair or restore the altar of the true living God. Amen. Because why? Well, that was the place of worship, church. That's where the sacrifices were made. That's where man went to meet with God. Okay? And so Elijah knew that the first thing that he needed to do was repair the altar. And when I was thinking about that, you know, there was a while back, I don't, I mean, it could have been years ago, I don't know, but I remember we had a message on our sign out here, and it said, uh, um, a family altar alters families, and for some reason that one always stuck with me, because it is so true, church, we, we need a family altar, we need an altar, and I'm not talking about us going out and, you know, grabbing 12 songs and building us an altar in our living room, okay? I'm talking about spiritually. We need an altar that you and I go to in order to make our sacrifice to the Lord, to make, offer up our sacrifices of praise and presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice. And those are some things we're going to look at today. But the first thing that I want to talk to you today about in regards to the altar is that the altar is a place of sacrifice. Okay? And what do we have to offer God as a sacrifice? And if you're like me, I feel like there's very little I can offer God. But there is something that we are called to offer to God as a, as a sacrifice. Okay, and first thing I want to look at, and if you can turn there with me or we'll have it up here on the screen, is in Hebrews chapter 13 and verses 15 and 16. And I've told you before that I believe that, that Paul was the writer of Hebrews. So whenever I talk to you about the writer of Hebrews, I'm talking about Paul. But here Paul writes in verse 15 and 16. I'm going to give you a minute to get there. I don't want to move too fast. You let me know when you're there. Give me an amen. 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 I said we have it up here on the screen as well. In verse 15, Paul says, Therefore, by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And in verse 16, But do not forget to do good and to share for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Amen. You see, what does he say? What is a what is a offering a sacrifice that we can offer to the Lord? Well, the first is our praise, church, our thanksgiving, our praise to the Lord, and our thankfulness for who He is, 
for who He is and what He has done for us on our behalf. You know, when we sat here this morning and we gathered together in worship and in praise, was that for our benefit or was that for the benefit of the Lord? It was for the benefit of the Lord. It's for Him. It's, it's our offering to Him. And when we have a heart of worship and we approach God on that level of humility and we, and we cry out to Him with thanksgiving in our hearts and gladness in our hearts for, for who He is, listen, it, 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 it reaches up to God as a sweet-smelling aroma. It pleases the Lord. It pleases the Lord. But listen, you know, the thing about praise and thanksgiving is often we let our circumstances, our emotions dictate our worship. We let it control us and, and determine how we worship the Lord. But I can tell you that our worship is whenever we are focused on our circumstances and our situations and our focus isn't on Him, it's not an act of worship. An act of worship is you turning your hearts, your minds towards God and, and you giving Him the thanks and the praise for who He is. For who He is. And He is a good God, a holy God, a righteous God. And that He's a God who loved us so much that He would send His only Son to die for us. That you and I might have a restored relationship with God the Father. But the second thing that He says here, and this is not, it's not only, listen, that we are to uh, give Him a, a sacrifice of praise, but also, listen, there's, there's a work involved. Okay? And, and it's an act of service to the Lord, an act of sacrifice. And we see that in verse 16, but do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. So there's an act of worship that comes from our praise and our thanksgiving, but there's also an act of worship that comes from our actions, our deeds, what we do. And Jesus says, let your light so shine before men, right, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, after, you know, in verses 8 and 9, we see, For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, and not a works lest any man should boast. But in verse 10, he says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, that, that he has preplanned beforehand that we should walk in them. And what we see, church, is, is there is an act of worship that comes from what we do, Amen. how we live our lives, how we serve people. How we serve each other. How we, how we minister to one another. And, and church, that's an act of worship. It's an act of sacrifice that we would bring before the law, the Lord. And we lay it down on the altar and we present it to Him. And listen, when we do that with a heart that is pure and genuine and is not out for selfish gain, God is pleased for that, with that. God blesses that. But not only... Uh, are we to offer up our praise and our works to Him, but we're to offer up our whole beings as well. And I want to explain that to you. If you would, turn to Romans chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2 for a moment. Like I said, we're going to be doing a lot of turning back and forth this morning. I, there's a lot of scriptures that I want to bring out this morning, and you can look up there on the screen and read along with me too if you'd like. In, verse, in chapter 12, in verse, um, in verse 1 and 2, Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Paul says that, that we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice to the Lord. When it's talking about the body, it's talking about our whole makeup. Okay, about all that we are, our whole being. And what he's saying is, is that we are to offer ourselves to God. Church, you know, we, we talked about this the week before last in regards to making a choice, a decision. Choose this day whom you will serve. You know, Jesus confronts the church in Laodicea. In Revelation chapter 2. And he tells them that they are neither hot nor are they cold, but they're lukewarm. And he says because they're lukewarm, he's about to spew them out of his mouth. God's not pleased with lukewarmness. He's, but listen, he's not pleased with cold either, alright? He wants us alive in God. Serving him, obeying him, seeking him. 
And what that is, is we surrender our hearts and our lives to Him wholly, completely. We don't, listen, we don't withhold anything from Him. But we give Him our all, our everything. And Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You know, your reasonable, I was thinking about that. What does he mean by reasonable service? Well, what has God done for you? I had to ask myself that question. What has God done for me? Listen, God, we can't ever repay God for what He's done for us. I'm not going there with that, okay? But what God is looking for is for a heart of surrender that surrenders our all to Him and gives us, gives Him our everything. And Paul's saying, listen, we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice to the Lord, holy and acceptable to Him. But then he says in verse 2 of chapter 12, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I know you've probably heard it. I know I've heard it many times, you know, that we are to be in the world but not of the world. And you don't actually see that, those particular words like that in the Scriptures, but you see it all throughout the Scriptures in detail through the Scriptures like what we see here. Because what Paul is saying is that, listen, we have to be in this world, but we cannot be conformed to this world. And what that means is that, listen, we can't take on its image. We can't be in its likeness. To be conformed to something means that that thing has changed you. But we're not to be conformed to this world. We're to be transformed. Right? By the renewing of our minds. How do we do that? By offering ourselves as a living sacrifice to God. Wholly acceptable in His sight. Giving Him our all, our everything. Not holding on to nothing, church. And listen, that, I, I know, again, listen, I, I've been in that area. I've been in that place where there's a choice to be made. And do I, am I all in for the Lord or am I not? And, Telling you, God is looking for us to be all in. That we present ourselves as a living sacrifice to the Lord, holy and acceptable to Him. That we are not conformed to this world, but we are transformed, being transformed by the renewing of our mind. That we may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Church, we have to, we have to shed the things of this world. And I know that's scary for a lot of people. Because you're thinking, man, what do I have to give up? Well, I can tell you anything that God asks you to give up, you need to give up. Amen. But He'll replace it with something far greater, far better. Because the things that you put, all the, all the, all the hard work that you put in to gain in the things of this life may please you, satisfy you for a moment, for temporarily, but the things of the Lord will satisfy you completely and wholly. Eternally. But Paul says, be you not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that transformation, church, that transforming of the mind is, listen, we're becoming more and more like Christ the more we surrender our lives to Him and allow Him to do the work that only He can do in us for His glory, for His purpose, for His kingdom. Whenever we surrender our hearts and our lives to Him, the altar is a place of sacrifice. And the second point that I want to make is, is a, the altar is a place where God and man interact and, and an exchange is made. Okay? And if you would, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 18 for a moment. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 18, uh, Paul says, For through him... We both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Through who? Through Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one will enter into the Father except, well, how? Through me, he says. There's but one way to the Father, that's through Christ Jesus. And it tells us in Hebrews that Jesus entered in behind the veil, all right? And he provided a way for us to have a relationship, fellowship with God the Father. And it's through Christ. And that's what Paul is speaking of here in Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18, he says, For through Him, 
we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. And, and I, this just caught my attention. I don't know if this goes along with what we're talking about exactly, but this, is a, this points us here to the Trinity, right? I mean, we see mention of Jesus, right? God the Son. We see the Spirit, God the Spirit. We see God the Father in, in this passage of Scripture. But it's one God manifested in three persons, right? But here... Paul is saying that, listen, we can have access to the Father through Christ Jesus by one Spirit. And whenever the, whenever the Israelites would come and they would present their offerings before the Lord, they would bring it to the, to the Levitical priest. The Levitical priest would prepare the offering and, and they would bring it behind the veil. And in the veil was the place of the Ark of the Covenant in that Holy of Holies, in that innermost part of the temple. And that is to believe, is believed to where the Shekinah glory of God was, was present in behind that veil. But we know that Jesus entered in behind the veil, but not only did He enter in behind the veil, but He tore the veil from top to bottom, opening up that access that we have through Christ Jesus directly with the Father. And when we come before the altar, when we come to the Lord in, in sacrifice, and we come to the Lord and we, and we present ourselves to Him, Listen, we have access to Him through Christ Jesus. The altar provides us access with, with Him. And at this place, there's also an exchange made. And, and I want to read to you Ephesians chapter 4, verses 21 through 24. Here Paul says, If indeed you have heard Him and have been taught by Him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that renewed actually means renovate. All right, we have our minds renovated. There is that word again. And that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Listen, whenever we come to the Lord and by faith, whenever we confess Christ Jesus as our Lord, there's an exchange that happens. It's Him. I mean, us for Him. All right, we, it's, it's a shedding, it's a getting of, off of that old nature, that old man, and we are being given a new nature in Christ Jesus. When we approach the Lord, when we approach that altar, listen, we are dying to that old man, that, that old uh, flesh, that nature. And we're becoming more like Christ in, in character and obedience as we grow in our faith in the Lord. And, you know, Paul says here that, uh, that you put off concerning your former conduct. I don't know about you, but I'm not who I used to be. I'm a different man standing before you here today than I was, you know, some almost 20 years ago. Because that old man was serving himself. He was not serving the Lord. I was serving the flesh, trying to gratify the flesh, and there was no walking in the Spirit. But we are to give ourselves wholly to the Lord presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice unto Him that He, listen, may then work in us to create within us a new nature, a new life, to make us a new creature in Christ. In the moment of our confession of faith, listen, we are born again. We're a new creature in Christ. But every day from that on is a day that we are being sanctified, set apart for God. And through that process of sanctification, God is transforming us. He is changing us. And also the, um, the, the altar is a place of, of con, um, consecration. The altar was a place where one consecrated oneself fully to God. And, and here in Colossians in chapter 3 and verses 1 and 17 through 17... Um, it says here, Paul writes here in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. He says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. 
Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. And that's past tense, church. It's no longer do we walk that way, because we're a new creature in Christ. He says, in which you once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all of these. Anger? I mean, come on, anger? How many of us struggle and deal with anger? Right? I mean, let's be honest. I mean, how many times do we let anger control us when, you know, when, when the pressure is applied and, and all of a sudden we, we act out in anger? Right? We take it out on our spouses, on our children. We act in anger. But he says, um, and you put off anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, Barbarian, Scythian, slave, nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even so, as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. And that, that's a big one for a lot of people. That unforgiveness. That issue of unforgiveness in our lives. And can I tell you, if you cannot find yourself in a place of forgiveness, then you're going to be in a place where you're trapped by unforgiveness. It's going to keep you as its slave. Only in unforgiveness will you find peace. Only in unforgiveness will you find rest for your soul. Because when you harbor unforgiveness in your heart and in your life, it controls you. You don't control it. And it can ruin you. But it says here, and let peace, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ, Christ dwell in you richly, um, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word and, or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, given. Thanks to God, the Father, through Him. I want you to look at that transition of that old man and that new man, right? That old man is what? He's controlled by the lust of the flesh. That new man is controlled by what? By the Spirit of God. Because and if we look in Galatians in chapter 5, we see the fruits of the Spirit, right? And we see that, listen, if you, it tells us if you walk in the Spirit, if you walk in the... Um, in, in the flesh, you just you satisfy the desires of the flesh, but if you walk in the Spirit, then you satisfy God. We are to walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. We are to surrender our hearts and our lives to Him and bringing it back to that whole altar thing. That means that, listen, we approach the altar on a daily basis and we present ourselves as a, as a living sacrifice to God that He may do His work in us and through us and that His will may be accomplished and not ours. And what, what Elijah was dealing with here, if you want to turn back to 1 Kings for a moment, in 1 Kings chapter 18, is Elijah was coming before the Lord on behalf of the people, he says, in order to turn the hearts of the people back to God, right? Church, God, I can tell you that there's a need for that in the church today. In the church, not the, I'm not saying the world, absolutely the world, but in the church today, where the hearts of the people need to be turned back to God. Because I can tell you that we may worship all about man and not enough about God. We have made our church services a lot more about man than we have about God. And God is trying to turn the hearts of the people back to Him. And that means that we're going to have to be willing to approach the altar in humility. With a heart of sacrifice that says, God, I'm going to give you my praise and my thanksgiving no matter my circumstance. No matter my situation. God, I'm going to present myself to you a living sacrifice, my all, my everything. I'm not going to hold it, withhold anything from you. I'm going to give it all to you. It means that, listen, we're going to have to come before the Lord. We're going to have to consecrate ourselves before the Lord. Meaning that, listen, we're ready to lay everything down on the altar. All our desires, all our, everything that maybe takes our attention, our focus off of Him. And we say, 
God, I'm giving it all to you today, and I'm sacrificing it on the altar. And can I tell you that when a sacrifice is made to God, the fire God consumes it completely. It takes it away. It does away with it. But listen, He's not going to take from you what you're not willing to give Him. You've got to be willing to give it to Him. You've got to be willing to present your offering on the altar to the Lord. And only then, then and only then, will you see a move of God in your life. Because listen, God's not going to stay where He's not welcome. Listen, Israel decided they were going to turn away from the, from the true God and turn to the worship of Baal. God turned them over to it. And it's the same thing in our lives, church. Whenever we're unwilling to give our, our lives to the Lord and we're, we're unwilling to walk away from that, which He's telling us to walk away from, He's going to turn us over to it. And that's why I see many, many, many a Christian, many people fall into great despair and hardship and is because they're not willing just to let it all go to the Lord, to give it to Him, to say, God, all I have is yours. He's asking for you to bring it to the altar. And you know what will happen? In verse 38, it says, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up the water that was in the trench, meaning that it completely consumed everything, the fire of the Lord. The Bible tells us that, the, that our God is a consuming fire. Listen, He's a sanctifying fire. He will, he will come in and He will cleanse and He will heal and He will restore. And that's His heart. That's His desire. That's what He wants to do in your life. He wants to heal you. He wants to restore you. So you've got to let go of the things in your life that are taking your focus and your attention off of Him. And you've got to say, God, I'm all in. And you know what? All of a sudden, the hearts of the people were turned back to God because we see here in verse 39, it says, Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. I can't speak for all of you, but I can speak for myself. I want a move of God in my life. I want a move of God in this congregation. I want it to be more about Him and less about me. I want to be in a place in my life where I'm willing to surrender all to Him. What about you? The truth of the matter is He's the answer to all things. He is. But there's a choice that needs to be made, a decision that has to be made. And that is, am I, am I going to serve Him or am I going to serve myself or serve the world? We have to get off of that middle ground. There's nothing beneficial on that middle ground. Jesus says, you're either for me or you're against me. <laughs> There's no middle ground. You're either hot or you're cold. If you're lukewarm, He's going to spit you out of His mouth. Where do you rest today? Where do you stand today? Where's your stand? Would you please stand? We're going to go into a time of invitation. Would you come this morning to the altar? Would you come this morning and, and would you say to God, God, I surrender my all to you this morning. Listen, all, everything that I'm dealing with and struggling with, all my anger, all my pride, all my unforgiveness, all those things in your life that you know is a hindrance from you moving into a deeper, more personal relationship with God. Come this morning, the altar's open. Would you come this morning and present yourself a living sacrifice to God? Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, and I believe that this describes it so well. 
Paul says, for I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, he says, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Paul knew what it meant to surrender his all to the Lord. That's why he could say, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. So Paul knew that, listen, his circumstances did not determine who was God. It didn't change who was God was. His God was still consistent, constant in his life. He was just willing to all bring everything to the altar and lay it down before the Lord and give it all to Him as an offering. An offering of praise. Church, you have something to be thankful for this morning. I believe we all do. We're going to play through this song the altar's open. I'll be over there at the side if you'd like to play this morning. You go.